Um, let me quickly introduce today's host. A little bit different format today. Um, we've got Neil Manbar from Sentry. Neil is a solutions engineering manager. And then we've got a customer joining us today from Eventbrite, Vincent Budrovich. Vincent is a senior software engineer, like I said, at Eventbrite. Uh, so they're going to talk through how they use Sentry's release health. A uh, quick peek at the agenda. We'll start with introductions, take a quick recap through Sentry's pillars. Then we'll talk release health, how to instrument it, why releases are important, and then a product demo. And then we'll hear from Vincent on how his team at Eventbrite uses release health. Uh, and then a little bit of a back and forth discussion uh, between Vincent and Neil, what Vincent and his team like about the products and where they could see improvements and then kind of going back and forth there um, to look through Sentry's roadmap on this product. And then we'll wrap things up with, as always, Q&A. So I will stop talking and pass it over to Neil for the good stuff. Uh, Neil, if you want to take it away. Sounds good. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we'll go right in from there. First of all, thank you everyone for taking the time uh, during these tough times uh, and uh, watching this webinar and participating and such. Um, but before we get started, uh, y'all are probably wondering a few things outside of what is this feature? How do I use it? How much does it cost? So let's get right to it. It's why do I look so different than that picture? One is a pandemic. I haven't gotten a haircut in a long time. <laughs> Second, aging. <laughs> that picture was probably taken three to four years ago. So probably a good uh, note for me to update it. The second thing I do want to disclose before I get started on uh, this release health journey and showing you guys what's up here um, is I have a job. My wife has a job. I got a dog during COVID. I tell him every day he doesn't have a job, but he really thinks it's his job to alert bark left and right. So apologies if there's any barking. Um, I'll do my best with that. But with that being said, I'm going to do my job and show you guys release health now. So let's get started. So first, uh, let's just position ourselves you know, in our everyday jobs where we're maintaining a production website or a service. Um, and before we had Sentry for error exception and crash monitoring, we didn't know about our errors, right? So you know, I'd be playing racquetball. And then all of a sudden, I'm getting a call from my manager saying, hey, a lot of customer support tickets are coming in, trying to figure out what happens. I have to reproduce it, go from there, understand what's going on, and then fix it. But with Sentry's error monitoring SDK, I put it right in there. It alerts me when things go wrong. I see the who, what, when, where, why of the problem, and even the commit that caused it. So great, now I get to play more racquetball. But then I was playing foosball with my friends and a slowdown happened. And it took me forever to figure out whether it was a front end, the back end, you know, was it because I wasn't lazy loading something, I was doing everything synchronously. And then came out Sentry's performance monitoring offering. So I, I, I did a one line change to my SDK or a couple line change just to, to make sure transactions were shipped up. And now I understood when things were slow in addition to the errors and when these things were related. But then we started accelerating our release cycles, pushing more code out there, new features, new bug fixes and such. And I still didn't know entirely what was going on, but Discover came along, I was able to analyze, figure out trends, figure out exactly you know, the timeline view and query the entire data set. And then I was able to set alerts from Discover or on issue alerts, uh, whether transactions you know, slowed down or new errors happened, et cetera. So great, now I got a workflow. But what was really missing as we were accelerating the release cycle is what is the impact of this release to my customers? Are they onboarding onto my application properly? Are they able to get in and get out properly? Are overall new issues being discovered? What exactly is happening? What is the crash-free rate? A big part of this is that Sentry didn't have that session or the denominator here and wasn't able to derive the percentage. So that's why we introduced release health. And I'll explain how all of this works, but with release health, we have a first class interface for releases and we can see exactly what's going wrong. If people are onboarding successfully, what the user adoption is and see this from release to release and monitor accordingly. So it gives us a good starting point to figure out, is my release healthy? Is it impacting users negatively? And if it is, let's go in and find the specifics. So let's get right into it. Just a quick sneak peek here. I'll explain all of this in just a bit. 
but we'll have the release. We'll have metrics on the sessions, the percentages, new issues, transactions, all within one screen. But before we do that, let's go through the instrumentation and how to do this. So I'm gonna go ahead and start at the docs and let's go right in from there. So here, we're obviously here for JavaScript. And y'all are familiar with this, right? But installing the SDK, sentry.init, and then your DSN. We also wanna bind the version and let Sentry know which version these events are coming from. And then here we have the tracing or the performance piece, and we want 100% of these to be sent up. So this is the base configuration with error monitoring and performance. Next, what I wanna do is just head over to configuration, go over to releases and health. And now the only thing we'll have to do in addition to binding the release is this one line change right here, auto session tracking false or auto session tracking to true. So that will send the session up on every page load and every navigation change. And it'll also on the Sentry server side, we'll be able to understand when things crashed, whether it was due to a unhandled error or something that was handled. So you're going to see healthy sessions. You will also see aired sessions and crashed sessions and all the specifics of this. So here's the summary of what happens basically, is that basically the SDK will manage the start and the end of the sessions when it's initialized and will create a session for every page load and accordingly as well. And then a crash is defined as an unhandled error. And if we handle something that will be marked as an error. So this is all we need to do in our configuration. And in my example, I have this tool store that you likely are uh, so privy to if you've uh, worked with Sentry and seen some of our demos and webinars. And what I wanna do here is just show the code behind this and the SDK configuration. So sentry.init, we have the DSN, the release. We wanna know that events are coming from production. Here is the configuration for, for, for performance and then the one line change to turn on release help. And I believe this is gonna be defaulted true, uh, but uh, for if you're, if you're coming right into Sentry. Alrighty, so now let's head over to Sentry and see exactly what's occurring. So we're gonna head over to releases here. I'm gonna go ahead and just search my data set here. And let's go and just select one project just to be. I'm gonna go ahead and select a team they view at first. So here, it looks like about an and a half ago, I created a release. Another release was created uh, a day ago. And you can see that folks started using this one. And the next day, we're also using this. And then that second day, another release 163.3 was, was sent up. I'm going to go ahead and search a 24-hour view. And we'll just evaluate the last two releases here. So we can see here, this was deployed. Using it, people stopped using it. People started using this. and go from there. And here, 322 crashes were experienced amongst three new issues. So from here, I can derive that this is not the, the experience that I want to provide. The, the crash-free sessions is at 96.2% here. I should go investigate. It looks like uh, I had this uh, app out while 2.4k users adopted it. And then I put a new one out. But let's go ahead and view this data set and go from there. So just from here, I can tell, are folks adopting it properly? Are there new crashes happening? And should I investigate? And here are here is where we're gonna see the exact specifics. I'm gonna go ahead and dive into this data set right here. And let's go ahead and view healthy. So clicking any of these will, will events to be seen here. Now we can derive that Hey, it looks like overall we were healthy. We had a dip in traffic here, but there were a lot of crashed and abnormal sessions as well. So let's go ahead to the right rail and view the aggregate metrics from there. So it looks like we had 96.2% crash free sessions with 96.16% on the crash free users. So as I, this is if you're setting a uh, user context, we'll be able to also derive that. We can see how many folks adopted this, how many new issues were experienced, which are listed right here. And we'll dive into a bit. and how many crashes, unhandled errors and exceptions were bubbled up and resulted in folks not being able to end their session cleanly. 
the app decks if you're sending performance information as well, and then release details, commit information as you're uh, accustomed to if you're using Sentry releases, and so forth. And from here, we can also show session duration, so we can see how folks were, how long folks were in our application, the count, the crash free rate in this graph, so that we can understand how that's evolving over time as well, and if you're sending web vitals and such, we have all of that information listed as well. So a big point here is you understand what's going on with your application, not just the errors that happen in the performance, but were folks able to you know, get to your app, add the cart, buy that hammer, et cetera. Now from here, I can see the new issues, hop into any of these new issues, figure out the commit that caused it and so forth. I can open this in the issue stream or open this within Discover to get a timeline view of what was going on and further investigate as well. But for the time being, I'm gonna focus back on release health. And then here we have the failing transactions as well. So from within here, I can open up any of the transactions, open all of this up in Discover as well, and go from there. So one other use case might be, you know, hey, it looks like this transaction slowed down within this release. I wanna go ahead and make sure that something like this doesn't happen again. So I could very easily open this within Discover and create alert accordingly as well. So on the count or any of that and set an appropriate threshold and go from there as well. to release health, so just go into here. Let's take a view at this, which is the latest, which I hope fix them and improved the experience over time. So here's that data set. Let's once again view healthy. When you can see, we now have moved to 98.5, but we still have some issues in here. You can see that things are getting better and that this one bit helped things but we're still having some issues in terms of some errors. And from here, we can navigate it to see all the different issues to see exactly what was impacting it and then dive in and go through the workflow to fix these things and go from there. So what we see here is that releases was a first class object within Sentry, right? We tagged them. We even sometimes created them via Sentry CLI. We associated commits and artifacts. But what we've done now is made release a first class interface and a first class overview so that you can understand what's going on and then dive into the appropriate place. A big part of Sentry is that we don't wanna keep you in the tool for too long. As I said, it's important to me for, to play a lot of foosball, to, to hang out with my dog, uh, play racquetball. I wanna be in and out of this. So as we release and as we push new code out there, improving the user experience and new features, we can head over to Sentry releases and figure out what exactly went wrong. Not only from which commits went wrong, but now from the user commits went out and which errors were introduced, but now is the user experience okay? Are we improving it over time? What are the specific issues happening in this release? How is it impacting session duration and crash rate rate and such like that? And then uniting all of this with transactions as well to kind of figure this out. So it's not just about seeing what's broken and seeing what's slow, but it's seeing what's broken and slow in your release. Hopefully that doesn't happen too often. And then being able to act on it from there. So that's it in a nutshell in regards to the feature. It's very easy to enable. Oh, I forgot, did I mention it's free? So all you have to do is just turn this on and then you know, send the session events come up. Sentry eats a cost for that, providing you more actionability from the data that you're sending up here. So we want you all to understand what's going on with their application, not just errors and performance, but in terms of release, release adoption, release impact, and these percentage metrics, and be able to act on it from there. All right, I'm done pitching. Um, haven't heard my dog bark so far, so I'm pretty happy about that. Uh, Vincent, you mind taking over? Sure. Um, yeah, so before I share my screen, I'm just going to give a quick kind of like how uh, my team found the feature. Um, it's kind of a funny story. We we're accidental early adopters. Um, and 
basically as we adopted Sentry Cloud and I was looking through the dashboards and saw that there were some kind of hints around session health and other things, but were active. Um, so dug into the docs, saw it was available on the mobile SDK. It's kind of, huh, this is interesting. It's not there for JavaScript yet. So I went to their GitHub JavaScript repo um, for the Sentry JavaScript and dug through their releases and commits until I found that variable that Neil just shared and enabled it. And we started getting Sentry data um, a bit before the official release or session data, excuse me, um, which was pretty fun. Uh, and it's been very useful for our team to get a quick idea of how a given release is doing in the context that like, yeah, you might see a spike, but is it affecting 1% or 20% of users and being able to prioritize that. Um, so I'll share my screen really quick. Cool, so this is um, the releases page for uh, that team, for the app that my team owns, which is the search browse and homepage for eventbrite.com. Um, and I kind of jumped into that. Sorry, I'm a, like I mentioned before, a senior software engineer at Eventbrite, um, and we own this given app. Um, so like we release a fair amount, we even released earlier today. Um, we're all about trying to move towards more uh, and smaller releases just to be able to identify issues faster. And so let's dig into this one because I have some interesting data. And when this went out, I was looking and you can see there's a spike here. And I was like, oh crap, that's actually a decent amount of like That's a decent amount of errors that pop up. Let's see just in the grand scheme of things, what's the priority for this? Oh, okay. It's only about I don't know, 6% of users saw this spike. Um, and you can also drop down and see crash free rate to get a clear idea of what percentage. And that kind of gave me an idea of what the priority should be. It also resolved itself pretty quickly and gives me a clue into the maybe this was triggered from a back end and we need to do some better error handling on our front end. So just from this view, I can gather that much information about what the next action should be to address these spikes in the future. Um, and yeah, so then usually when I see something like this, I'll grab the spike, open it and discover, uh, sort by count and nine times out of 10, you'll see what that is. So yeah, we have this unknown error with 11K instances, clearly the main issue and it's something that our team has already has on our roadmap to address and look at for a future release. Um, so that's just kind of a quick overview of how our team managing the homepage search and browse experiences has been able to leverage this functionality to um, prioritize bugs and identify how well it is being experienced by our actual end users. Um, yeah, so I think that's a kind of a quick run through of how we found the feature, how our team's been adopting it into our workflow, and we have a lot more future plans to leverage it even in a larger fashion as we move forward um, but yeah so i think that's that's about it for the overview on my end uh neil if you want to take over yep no problem here we go Thank you. And I'm going to head over to the Q&A here. I know this was a little bit short and sweet, but we wanted to keep this to the point. Oh, I'm not sharing the right screen here. Here we go. All righty. Cool. And I wanted just to prompt Neil and Vincent uh, just before we jump into Q&A. Um, you know, Vincent, maybe maybe some things that it sounds like you mentioned a few things that you like about uh, release health, maybe some some things that you'd like to see Sentry develop and improve on with regards to release health, anything that comes to mind um, on your end? Yeah, there's a, definitely a few things. Like it's an amazing tool that there's always places for improvement, right? And uh, one area would be to the, filters and custom dashboards that you can make and discover. Um, like we have an app that is essentially three sub apps within a single release and being able to see how a given release is performing split by those tags. Like we have discover dashboards where we split each app up, but 
the release is for the entirety of it. And so it's hard to say like, oh, where is this exactly coming from until you dig into the discover and do that extra work. But it'd be great to kind of see um, those discover dashboards and the release self interact a bit more uh, closely. Yeah, you. I think uh, you're on the right track, Vince. Uh, so Discover today is querying our global events table, which is really at the event level, right? So we're looking to bring in more and more. So for example, issues are gonna be one part of it and then release health and such like that. Today we have like the releases markers and you, I see what you're saying, you're having to, to dive in separately for each release. But the plan is to basically move more into Discover uh, into that kind of unopinionated fashion so that you can pivot and and interact with the data to find the answers that you need. So definitely that's in the plan. So I just need the time for, for, for getting that stuff done. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that's, that's, that's definitely one thing. Um, and another thing that would be awesome is some kind of, uh, we're looking to move towards CD as a company or continuous deployment. And um, for using a release help as a metric for if we should auto rollback um, via query, via API, or like setting an alert around that metric, like that would be uh, a pretty awesome feature to have. We're not too far along the CD uh, journey yet, but that is something that as we're planning it out would be a killer feature. Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, to that, there's two aspects. There's uh, one, the alerting, and then there's two, the data. Let's tackle the second one first. So everything that you see on Sentry is accessible via API. So you know, technically, you could hit the API and derive this this information, um, and then act accordingly, right? And like you mentioned, roll back or halt to build or whatever it is. Uh, the second part of it is that we're looking to move some of this into alerting as such, uh, so that you can then, hey, if things spike or you know the crash for users and uh, that that uh, within unacceptable bounds, that would alert and you can kind of webhook that, etc., and then act accordingly as well. So two different kind of uh, ways to achieve it, um, and uh, the second one is possible today because you see that data, you can grab that data. The first one we're going to have to add uh, a little bit more functionality around to kind of enable that workflow in that programmatic fashion. For sure. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, it's not on our immediate roadmap, but something that we're kind of thinking forward um, in that space. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've been at Sentry for uh, a good minute, and that's something that's been on my mind, like, all the time. You, you know, we could, we could have, you know, if, 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 take the information from Sentry and act accordingly, whether it's, you know, coming from an automated test build or it's coming from a staging environment or, you know, some, you're doing a stage rollout, right, into production and, and you can be like, hey, this is a, not where I want it, right? So mm -hmm. let me roll mm -hmm. that back, et cetera. Um, for sure, uh, that's the type of workflow that we want to enable is like give you the data set to, to, to act accordingly, to push with confidence uh, and roll back with confidence if, if, that, if that occurs. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. So those were kind of the two, two of the top things on my mind for areas that I like. Kind of uh, nice to have, I guess, going forward. Um, uh, besides that, though, like mentioned, uh, it's really nice how easy it is to digest and identify the overall health of a given release just from that. Like, I love how it's just very easy to digest and keep SLAs or SLOs for our various uh, services at a certain level. So. Really loving the future that's going out. Thank you. Yeah, we're we're looking to to do a bit more with it as well. Uh, this is this is definitely uh, an exciting feature for us to to get out to developers and, and you know hopefully give them some time back to play racquetball and foosball. You can see what I'm all about. <laughs> all right, cool, great discussion, guys. I'm gonna hop into some questions here. We've got a decent number of them. Uh, I th I think the most popular, most asked one. Uh, is, is this available for React Native? Yeah, uh, I let me get back to you. I think we're about to port this to React Native. Uh, we have the React Native SDK is a superset of a few SDKs, including the JavaScript SDK. So as soon as we bump all of this stuff up and then make sure that, that it's uh, good for the lower layers, uh, React Native will get the same love. Cool. Uh, someone wanted to confirm the auto session tracking. Should that be false or true? Yes, that should be true. Auto session tracking, true. That means this is going to be sent up. 
so if you're uh, the context that I kind of said that in is if you're migrating from an old SDK and don't want this kind of uh, turned on, uh, go ahead and mark it false so that you know you don't have sessions being sent up. Uh, but it, explicitly turn it on uh, so that you know it's being there. Otherwise, if you're starting with Sentry today, you'll have all of this out of the box. Someone asked, how can we remove health pages from performance tracking? Remove health pages from performance tracking. Um, I'm not too clear on that question. Uh, is it okay if I follow up with you right after this? Yeah, sure. And whoever asked that question, if you want to just um, add some more context there, um, we'll try to answer it during this, uh, this session. Um, someone asked, how do you specify the version number? The version number, that's going to be the SDK. So SDK.init, uh, you'll have uh, the object that you send in, the DSN, and uh, the, the next thing is going to be the version. So basically the traffic or data coming from your app within the Sentry will have that as part of the payload and we'll be able to understand where it's coming from. Release health regarding React Native. Uh, we do have that. Sorry, uh, I'm a, I kind of am a JS developer and kind of focus on that area. And we do have that. Go ahead, turn it on. You'll get the same love. Cool. Uh, does the session tracking use the transaction quota? Good question. No, it's totally free. Uh, it's basically a different type of event. We call it an envelope and it has nothing to do with any quota. So sessions, envelope, uh, not deducting from quota. Um, is the stack agnostic? Would it make sense to use this with functions, lambdas? Yeah. Absolutely. So function and lambdas are interesting, right? Because when you have a crash or uh, you have something that's unhandled, it basically crashes the function and it's gone and you don't have that context. So having something uh, that's event-based like Sentry in there to when things go wrong or, or you know when a session is loaded, et cetera, send it up, you get that visibility. So absolutely, uh, you're going to get the same type of data. And we even have serverless integrations to help you get some of that serverless context. Uh, so you understand, you know, what, did it go out of some bound that 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 was defined and that's why it crashed, et cetera, and whatnot. So 100%. Great. Uh, what is the recommended source map config for web? Ooh, source map config for web. Yeah. Go ahead, uh, upload your source maps as part of your CI process. So basically the source map uh, will reside on Sentry. It's tied to a release. You're also binding the release at the SDK level. So basically when the event comes in, we look at the release, we look at which source map to apply, do that, get the actionable stack trace, use that for aggregation, and then go from there. So upload your source maps to Sentry, we'll apply them on ingestion. That's gonna be the best path. There's, there's another way to do it as well, fetch them, but you shouldn't be hosting your source maps and you don't want us requesting out to your servers anyways. Um, and that's kind of an optimistic way or the way I look at it, but go ahead, please upload your source maps. We'll apply them on ingestion. You get a good stack trace. You get the commit that you know uh, caused all this and then you go back to playing foosball. Great. Um, is it difficult to wrangle releases when you have a CI pipeline where you're pushing new builds hourly? <clears throat> Negative. So you can see, you know, uh, where in my example, I had like 167.1, 0.2, 0 0.3. That would just be stacked every hour, right? It's just the data associated with the release. It doesn't matter the increment uh, that, that you're doing it. Uh, Sentry understands that this release came after this release and this went out and uh, you can act on it from there. We actually want you to get to the point where you, like, uh, you know, Vincent was talking about CD, you know, we'll deploy every day, deploy every hour, push the limits, right? Um, that's, that's what we want to empower developers to do. Push the limits with, uh, some, with, with, with a reasonable uh, lens and with the visibility and observability they need so that they can act on it. Um, are the release metrics like sessions, crashes, abjects, is that all aggregated in the dashboard? Correct. Cool. Um, this one, I think, then was, oh, if you wanted ahead. to see any uh, more specific, like, uh, metrics regarding that, a lot of that's uh, within Discover as well. So you can hop over right into that to, to navigate in, in uh, that unopinionated fashion. Cool. Um, I think this one was for Vincent. Um, Vincent, when you were sharing your screen, you found that error with 11,000. Uh, sorry, you found that issue with 11,000. Um, I think it was users or maybe uh, that had experienced an error and it was kind of called unknown. Uh, what would 
what would that be in that case? And how do you debug when it's unknown? So just because the error in that case is unknown, it makes it a bit harder to dig into. But um, usually if you view the event, uh, it'll, you can see if it's been persisting across releases when it was first introduced, I can give you one clue. And also there is a, some still stack trace and other uh, ancillary data available with that error, even though the exact error is unknown. So you can kind of piece together where it's likely coming from and uh, some more testing. It's definitely a little harder since it's not a clear error that you're looking for, but um, it's still with the other metadata available, you can diagnose what it is. Yeah, I think the heat maps and your and the breadcrumbs will be your will be your friends um, in the absence of some of that information. Cool, thank you. Um, if we, for example, have a JavaScript client with a Python backend, can you track errors from both in the same release? Hundred uh, percent. So this was achievable actually without release health as well. But now, uh, basically, you would have your front end project, your back end project. And this is actually kind of how I set it up today. I was just in the front end scope, but since Sentry kind of treats all of these things as a global events table and it has cross project search and such, and with discovery, you can hammer uh, that data set. You can figure out that this error was associated with this transaction. And you know this is the related error on the front end, back end, and this is a transaction that it impacted, et cetera. How do, you def uh, how do you define a crash? Is that a browser crash or an actual JS error? Yeah, uh, our docs kind of go over this. It's anything that really uh, bubbles up as unhandled to window.onerror. So if there's something that you're try catching, that'll show up as errored. If there's something that bubbled up all the way that was unhandled and you know uh, halted JS execution, that's a crash. Cool. Um, any quirk or difference around Sentry release health uh, with mobile platforms like iOS or Android? Yeah. Really, it's the release cycle, like, like fundamentally, right? With web, you can just flash that anytime. The users just come, you know, uh, they come on board and you see all that. But what, you're kind of at the discretion of uh, the other marketplaces, right, to get your app out there. And uh, you have kind of longer releases in that sense. But the data and the interaction with the data is going to be the same, right? You're going to have issues. You're going to have transactions. Uh, you're going to have that metadata. And you're going to have the same views and such uh, and go from there. Uh, we're going to be making some improvements in regards to mobile as well and kind of being a little bit more opinionated in that sense. Uh, but using the feature, pretty much the same, right? You put your app out there. You want to know what's going on. Uh, you want to know if folks are using it successfully and then, you know, act on that data and, and prioritize any issues or transactions or, you know, if things are within acceptable bounds, fantastic. Um, thank you. Uh, can you split the release health by browser? So I'm not too clear on that question. Um, but let me follow up. Uh, you could query any of the data set. Uh, you know, to, you'll see there's a couple of uh, things that take you to discover, and then you could do a breakdowns per browser and such like that. Um, oh, I see. Oh, as folks are onboarding sessions, you want to know wh what browsers they're coming from. Hmm. I don't think that that's quite possible today. Let me let me follow up on that. How do you deal with the noise generated by those errors that you know aren't a crash? Yes, and those will be errors. So they're as part as part of my um, here. Let me actually just go a few steps and in, back into here, just to get to a screenshot right here. Uh, you see that the you know, real quick. You're still sharing the Q and A slide. If you're oh. to show something else, yeah. Give me one second. There we go. I just went to the introductory side here. So you see that the yellow is the healthy sessions. The pink or orange or melon or whatever this is, is the, the crash sessions. And then we have this kind of a uh, purple slash navy as the error. So this is the stuff that resulted in the JavaScript execution failing that bubbled up to window dot on error that was unhandled. And then anything that was handled that didn't constitute a crash is an error. So that could have still resulted in a successful session, but some problem happened that you knew could have happened and you captured it and, and acted accordingly. Great. 
So uh, long answer or uh, long story short, it'll show up as part of that aired piece. Cool. Any recommendations or best practices for naming your releases for, from either of you all? Yeah, our documentation goes over this as well. So you can do like a project name dash and then the versioning. So releases are now treated as a global kind of object uh, within the whole Sentry experience. So it's pretty good to kind of pre-append it with uh, a project name and then the versioning, whether that's a commit hash or semantic versioning or whatever it is. So basically use your base sort of versioning, whether it's semantic or um, Calver or whatever it is, um, or the hash and the pre-appending and the docs uh, do denote this as well. Cool. Um, let's see here. I'm going through the Q and A. There's been some more coming in, which is great. Um, do we have a request timeline to get the complete stack if error or unhandled exceptions crash? Can you repeat that one more time, Schaefer? Yeah. Do we have a request timeline to get the complete stack if the error or unhandled exceptions crashes? Uh, let me follow up on that one. I'm okay. not too clear on that one as well. I'm cool. Uh, and, and the person who asked that, if you want to clarify a little bit in your question, um, we can try to get back to it. Um, let's see what we got here. Where do we set auto session tracking again? Is that in the sentry.init call? Yes, exactly. Just another, uh, another uh, entry in that object. Cool. Um, in some JavaScript frameworks, specifically uh, Angular, all errors are caught globally. Is there any yes. way to override the handled crashed attributes so that the global error handler in a framework can mark things as a crash since it wasn't caught in a true try catch block? Yes. Good question. So there, I believe with uh, Angular, you hook on to its error handler, as you're mentioning, and then you call a sentry.captor exception. So you can feed some of that metadata, I believe, into that call to denote it explicitly as unhandled. And there's also a before send callback that you can uh, configure as part of sentry.init. So you can all overwrite any part of the event attribute or edit basically the payload before it goes out uh, to, to reflect that accordingly. So uh, go ahead and just basically pass that through accordingly or massage that behavior in and, and uh, the unhandled slash crash behavior should work. Cool. Let's see here. Um, another best practice question, any insight, uh, best practices on using React air boundaries? Yeah, <laughs> I am not the best JavaScript developer in the world. So I will tell you that I have been a JavaScript developer in my past life for a production uh, web app, but use your error boundaries, make sure, you know, things don't deconstruct like crazy. Uh, and then the same type of story is just make sure the unhandled slash, you know, the appropriate behavior uh, gets it all the way, uh, is reflected all the way through into Sentry, but go ahead and use them appropriately so that you're not having all sorts of crazy errors and crazy kind of stacks. Uh, uh, inter interfacing with each other uh, because React is trying to do a lot under the hood. Uh, we also have a blog post and some best practices documentation regarding uh, that specifically, but long story short is use them appropriately so that things behave within your bounds and within your expectation. Cool. Um, let's see if I've got anything else I haven't addressed that was upvoted. Um, looks like we've gotten to everything. Uh, one more uh, and then we'll wrap things up. Um, let's see, just lost it. Oh, here we go. Does tree record or help to figure out the timeouts of the request? Yes, so I believe that would fall under the transactions, right? Because we are basically hooking on uh, to some of those network calls and things like that. And you would, be, you would see successful transactions as opposed to non-successful and be able to uh, drill in from there and see what what's causing it, what's resulting in it. Cool. Um, in addition to, I think sometimes you know, if if there's the timeout, uh, it'll, it'll depending on how your code is handling it, it'll bubble up to you know uh, your code, and you could shoot that to Sentry to figure out you know what was sent and what was happening uh, that, that resulted in that request that timed out. 
Cool. Uh, one for Vincent. Vincent, um, someone was asking, uh, you had mentioned that you all or your team, uh, maybe your company as a whole is moving to more frequent, smaller releases. Um, any you know tips or recommendations you have for migrating to that sort of um, frequency? Um, I think the main thing to move in that direction is just have confidence in those releases and the ability to quickly roll back um, as you make them smaller, like you need to kind of improve the uh, CI and infra flow around that process to a point where you can uh, quickly and easily create a release, deploy it or and roll it back um, all in within like 10 minutes if need be. Um, I think that's probably the main thing that unlocked that direction for us. And we're just trying to keep double down that way. All right, last one, I promise, and then we'll wrap things up. What is the limit of the breadcrumbs push? Can I override whatever the limit is to have more breadcrumbs? Yeah, so the SDK does a bit of stuff to, in the case that you do have too many breadcrumbs, to basically pull the, the most relevant breadcrumbs, which is usually the, the latest ones. Um, there is a breadcrumb callback that you can specify and uh, modify any of the breadcrumbs or there's a breadcrumb limit as well. And there's a default limit as well. So it's more, hey, it's, it's under your control uh, and it'll be trimmed appropriately if, it, if, it's, uh, if there's too much. Awesome. Well, thank you both, Neil, Vincent, for, for your time today. Thank you all uh, for being here. Um, we will be following up uh, tomorrow, Monday at the latest with the recording. Uh, so if you want to go back and review anything that you heard today, um, feel free to do that. And like I said at the beginning, a very quick one question survey is going to automatically pop up in your browser after you leave. But appreciate you answering it so we can make future workshops like this even better. Um, and be on the lookout for an invitation to our March workshop. Uh, so stay tuned for that invitation. Until then, until next time, you all stay safe and uh, take care. We'll see you again.